Speaker Herlock, uh, I just want to start by welcoming this uh, motion from Sinn Féin. I think it's very timely and the Social Democrats will be supporting it. Um, it's very t a very timely debate following the publication of the Strategic Workforce Advisory Group uh, report uh, last month. And I want to say I also welcome Minister Butler's strong endorsement of all 16 recommendations um, of the advisory group's report. And I can assure you, Minister, that you will have the full support of the Social Democrats if you uh, proceed to implement those in a timely way. However, I am concerned about the fact that there is no clear timeline for the implementation. Um, and uh, while you, you talk about you know getting moving on it straight away, um, it, you don't set out a timeline. And I think that's a real weakness of it and that needs to be addressed. And that's why I've tabled an amendment to the motion this evening uh, calling for the publication of a timeline and that that would be published before Christmas or before the end of the year. Um, the issues and the solutions have been identified pretty well, I have to say, in the report. And now we need to accelerate the kind of reform that has been set out in that. And because we can't continue our over-reliance on institutional care, not least in the aftermath of COVID-19 and the devastating impact it had on nursing homes, but also the fact that it brought the whole issue of institutional care under the spotlight. And like I can recall, for example, uh, Deputy uh, Varadkar, and he was Taoiseach at the time, as far as I can recall, um, talking about us needing to radically change our view of the best model of care for older people. And like nothing has happened since then. There was all this talk that things have to change drastically, but nothing actually has happened. And we know that older people in the main don't want to be in nursing homes. We also know there's a lot of people in nursing homes that shouldn't be there at all. And they're there because there was no home care available for them. Uh, so there's lots of different reasons there. But, you know, in the main, um, people should be given other choices. The first one being being at home, living as independently as possible with home care. But we also, of course, have to look at the whole area of housing for older people. And like I've been talking about this for years, I have to say, there's very good models around, but what we should be doing is ensuring that pe people have some kind of uh, sheltered housing option uh, when the, their own house is too big or unmanageable for them, that they can move into sheltered housing. And then, you know, phased kind of grades of, of support available up to nursing home level, but nursing homes, you know, should in the main be the last option. Um, we've over 6,000 people on the waiting list for home care, Minister. Uh, that's a scandal. And so far this year, there have been more than 8,000 delayed discharges. Of these, over 10% were due to a shortfall in home carers. Now, you know, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to have large numbers of people. And at any one time, there's about five or 600 people in hospital who are ready to be discharged. Uh, and, you know, it is crazy that that situation is allowed to continue uh, for want of adequate home care, uh, adequate home care staffing, uh, in, in addition to some funding in some cases, but also step down facilities. And, you know, it, it's, an, it, it's an example of the dysfunction within the health service. And that should change uh, very urgently. Um, now, um, we, we, we can't stand over a situation where you've those that level of waiting lists and that level of inappropriate use of very expensive acute hospital beds. But under the watch of successive governments, we've seen it, rather than the state taking on responsibility for the provision of services directly themselves, we've seen creeping privatisation of the home care sector, with funding to private providers increasing from 3 million in 2006 to 176 million in 2019. Like so many other aspects of our health and social care system, the state has become disproportionately dependent on outsourcing care. Now, you know, I heard the term outsourcing of care being described actually in Waterford a couple of weeks ago. I was down at the SIP2 conference there. And uh, Emma Dowling, who's the author of an excellent book, Minister, if you haven't read it, I'd certainly recommend that you get it. And that is The Care Crisis. And she was saying, she made a, a, it's a terrific book, but in her presentation to SIP2, she made a very good um, point. She said, rather than talking about outsourcing, you know, we're really talking about extraction of wealth. 
from a care service. Because that's what it is. It's a model that includes the profit margin. And I mean, why are we doing this? You know, why are we making businesses um, out of what should be caring facilities? And they should be state provided caring facilities, in my view. Um, I would also say that uh, I'd make another recommendation. There's a woman in DCU, Kate Irving, who has written extensively on caring and specifically in relation to dementia, but made important points in relation to caring generally. And she, in a recent paper, which I'm very happy to share with you, she's, she made the point that we will continue to place responsibility for any version of person-centred care on the least qualified persons in the chain the home support worker. And I think that's a very de good description. Um, you know, the care of older people at a very critical time in their lives, and we will all get to that point, or hopefully we will get to a point late in life, but we will all more or less be looking for care at a certain stage. And yet it has been decided by successive governments that those people providing that critical uh, care, very sensitive need for proper care, um, are probably the least paid and the least qualified of all workers in our economy. And I mean, that just seems like turning logic on its head. And to make matters worse, we still have no regulatory framework or independent regulator. All we have is the HSE acting as a proxy regulator of providers delivering home care on its behalf. While home care provided directly by the HSE effectively undergoes no such scrutiny as it cannot be independent of itself. Worst of all, in theory, providers outside of the tender do not have to adhere to any standards whatsoever. That is the current situation, Minister, and it's frankly unacceptable. In relation to the tendering process, I think everyone accepts that the current model is not fit for purpose. It has created a race to the bottom with providers competing solely on price. Not only is this bad for the client, but it's completely unsustainable for workers in terms of pay and conditions. But it's November now, and it's still my understanding that the invitation uh, to tender has not been issued. Now, I read your amendment very carefully and tried to get around the weasel words, but it's not clear whether the tender has actually been issued or not. Minister, this was supposed to be issued by the end of quarter three for implementation on January 1st. I wrote to you about this last April when the plan to dramatically reduce the number of providers was first mooted. Seven months on and providers are still anxiously awaiting clarity, particularly smaller not-for-profit and community providers. Can you please update the House on the upcoming home care tender? Because the last I heard, Grant Thornton had been hired to assist with the procurement strategy. But that was during the summer. And can I just say that I didn't understand the need for private third-party assistance then. And I certainly don't know, uh, don't now see that. Uh, and uh, you still managed to miss the quarter three deadline, even though you had employed uh, outside consultants. At the very least, can you please give an assurance that the tender will ensure that all home care workers receive a living wage at a minimum, because that's the recommendation. And again, in your amendment, you acknowledge that, but you don't commit to doing it. So what I'm saying to you, can you give an assurance that when the tender document is issued, when you invite tenders, that it will provide for the payment of the living wage at a minimum in accordance with the recommendations in the report. I've tabled an amendment, as I say, uh, to provide for that. Um, since the advisory group published its report, the living wage for 22-23 has increased to 1385. So will the tender provide for that at a minimum? However, further changes are required to address chronic low pay in the sector. A reformed tender model should insist on an incremental pay scale, which recognises a worker's length of service, training and qualifications. Because in my view, at the crux of this is a lack of recognition of the vital work of the professional home carer. And that should not be the case. 
it would be also remiss, remit of us, remiss of us not to acknowledge that this is a workforce dominated by women. And that is certainly a factor in the historical undervaluing of this work. And the other point, of course, if there, was, if there were proper pay scales, it wouldn't be as difficult to recruit staff. And you would have a lot more men going into the service as well. So, you know, there's very strong arguments apart from the rights of, of workers to decent pay. So ultimately, these workers deserve our respect, not just with Thank positive platitudes, but with tangible measures which recognises the importance of their work and respects them and recognises the importance of collective bargaining, to name but a few things. Without these reforms, we will continue to struggle to recruit and retain staff. So, Minister, look, I'm putting those points to you. I will forward on the, the documentation I've quoted. But can you please clarify what the situation is about the tender document and about the living wage? Uh, turn now to people.